Our speaker today, Professor Karen Schutcher is a professor of German at the University of Oklahoma. Her uh, recent book on Goethe and Judaism came out in 2015 with Northwestern University Press and in 2020 in German translation with Wallstein Verlag. Her more recent scholarship includes articles on pluralism and the modernized Jesus in Mendelssohn Schiller and Schleiermacher and her articles on various aspects of Goethe's epigrammatic poetry. She is the outgoing editor of the GSNA sponsored series, New Studies in the Age of Goethe uh, at Bucknell University Press. And uh, she is the incoming co-editor along with Hester Baer of uh, German Quarterly, which um, seems to me is the premier journal in the field at least in America. Um, Professor Schutcher has received major fellowships from the National Humanities Center, National Endowment for the Humanities, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, uh, the German Ac Academic Exchange Service, Day A A Day, and uh, the Fulbright Commission. She's won uh, a number of prizes for her scholarship and her teaching. Um, and she is, uh, I can speak from personal experience, a beloved teacher and mentor here at the University of Oklahoma. And uh, I might add semi-personally, she's always been a wonderful uh, participant and a wonderful uh, contributor to Judaic studies here at, uh, at University of Oklahoma. And so without further ado, uh, uh, Professor Schutcher, take it away. Thank you for that very warm introduction, Alan. And it is really my great honor to be, to serve as affiliate faculty uh, with the Schusterman Center. And um, it's a pleasure to get to give this talk today. Um, go ahead and try to share my screen. Let's see. Hopefully everybody is seeing that. Okay. Okay, I plan to talk. So I think that's working. Okay, I plan to talk for about 30 minutes today and I hope then we can have a lively discussion. Um, I did put a handout in the chat so that everybody can follow along or maybe make their own observations about the fairy tale that um, I'm gonna be discussing today. There are two versions of it that are, I've created, uh, there's a sort of side-by-side -side comparison. Um, Okay, yeah, so when Alan asked me if I'd like to do a just lunch lecture this semester, I gave him the option of a topic related to my research or a topic related to my teaching. And I think we both agreed that this one drawn from my teaching was, was a better fit. Um, but I say this only as a caveat that this is not a deeply researched paper at all. I've never written anything on German fa on Grimm's fairy tales, but I do love teaching them. And I do so in several, different courses. So I will be drawing today on an exercise we do in a survey course I teach that I organize around national genres, uh, that is genres that contributed to, but sometimes also were deployed to subvert uh, the rise of German cultural nationalism in the 19th century. Examples are the folk song, the national epic, the domestic drama, etc. I see Ben Levinson <laughs> is on this uh, um, is with us and he's taken this course. So maybe Ben, you will have some um, ideas of your own to add after, um, after the talk. Um, okay, so what I will outline today is the way in which the fairy tale genre as developed by the Grimm's over 45 years constructed the social and cultural outsider or villain with great precision um, and thereby helped consolidate the logic of anti-Semitism in Germany with, of course, terrible consequences. And you can see I've modified my title a bit from what I, I gave to Alan, um, just to signal that emphasis on the villain. Now, um, okay, um, so moving on. I want to begin with a little context and by setting the scene for the Grimm's first collection of fairy tales. 
a landmark year was 1806. And that's the year that Napoleon's troops conquered Prussia. And you see Napoleon there uh, having uh, entered Berlin through the iconic Brandenburg Gate. Um, the, French, the French invasion sparked a conservative nationalistic uh, retrenchment on various levels of society, including among writers and intellectuals. In Berlin, for example, the previous couple decades had seen the emergence of more inclusive social forms, including the enlightenment oriented, oriented Wednesday society in which the Jewish philosopher Moses Mendelssohn had been a member. And then also um, a couple of very prominent intellectual salons run by Jewish women with, a, with wide participation across social class. One can contrast those institutions with a new intellectual society that arose in the Napoleonic era, the nationalist Christian German table society from which both Jews and women were banned. Jews who were denied civil rights in German lands tended to be lumped in with the French threat precisely because Napoleon had brought Jewish emancipation to the lands he conquered. And here you see a famous image celebrating Napoleon's granting of freedom of worship to Jews in 1806. So the Grimm's, uh, the Grimm brothers, Jacob and Wilhelm, had contacts with romantic circles, but lived in the city of Kassel in Hessen, where they worked as court librarians. And as you can see from the slide, under French occupation, Kassel had become the residence of Jerome, Napoleon's brother, now crowned King of Westphalia and living in a famous castle now renamed after Napoleon. So the whole fairy tale project begun in 1807 emerged out of deep resentment towards these foreign occupiers and with a sense of cultural and national crisis. So, in, and in this period of French censorship, it was also really clearly subversive in intent. But a problem with this nationalist project was that the fairy tales, um, which the Grimm's collected from various local storytellers in the region, were not themselves necessarily of German origin. Uh, for example, many of the tales published by the Grimm's appeared more than a century earlier in the French collection by Charles Perrault, um, including Little Red Riding Hood, Cinderella, and Sleeping Beauty. Although in fact, their roots are much broader and deeper still. Uh, it's worth noting that the Grimm's two most important sources, Dorothea Fiemann and Maria Hassenflug, were in fact women of Huguenot, i.e. French, ancestry. So my point is just to emphasize that the Grimm's were engaged from the get-go in a process of nationalizing a cultural heritage that was not at its core specifically German at all. Okay, so the first volume of the first edition of the Grimm's Fairy Tales came out in 1812 with a pointedly anti-French preface, albeit somewhat veiled to evade the censors. Um, and it was followed by the second volume in 1815. And over the next several decades, long after the French defeat um, and the demise of Napoleon, the Grimm's were indeed successful in establishing their fairy tales as a core element of a German national heritage and as foundational texts for the education of German children. By the 1850s, for example, fairy tales were required reading within the Prussian school curriculum. Um, but the Grimm's continued to revise their fairy tales through several editions until the final one in 1857. And the strategies apparent in these revisions will now be the focus for the rest of my talk. Okay, by, we can learn a lot by comparing the first and the last editions. If we imagine that the first edition might have been closer to the raw material collected orally, certainly the changes over time reveal the Grimm's intentional interventions. Um, for example, we can see their literary craft at work, um, their sense of genre, of tone, structure, and imagery. Um, we can see their attempt to make the tales more child appropriate with a clear moral economy of good and evil. Um, and finally, we can discern their nationalist program at work, um, sometimes subtly, but especially through their delineation of outsiders and villains. 
Uh, but before we return to the Grimm's most rapidly anti-Semitic fairy tale uh, to trace these changes, I want to use a fairy tale I suspect everybody knows, and that is Hansel and Gretel, in order to highlight some of the basic patterns in, their, in these changes. Okay. So what you find in the later 1857 version of Hansel and Gretel as composed to the earlier version is indeed a more literary texture and structure. There are more vivid details, like the description of witches as having red eyes and a keen sense of smell. There are folksy sayings that seem to contribute a feel of authenticity. Uh, for example, it ends with, my story is done, see a mouse run. Um, and there are hints of varying dimensions of reality. The 1857 version begins with a reference to economic conditions, uh, toil, uh, inflation that causes the familial crisis of hunger. Um, it was not in the earlier version. Um, but then from that one realistic element, you transition into a more dreamlike quality as the children fall asleep and find themselves abandoned in the forest. And on their return trip, the Grimm's added a water boundary between the enchanted forest and the realm of home, which the children have to be transported over by a white duck. Um, so what you end up with are kind of interlocking but separate realms. A, a, a famous scholar, Max Luthi, um, a famous scholar of fairy tales, talks about isolation and all connected, con sorry, all connectedness as a feature of fairy tales. And, and you sort of sense that with these two realms. Okay, um, the Grimm's strengthen the moral economy of the story by adding references to religion. The witch is godless, the children repeatedly pray. Um, and they add details that foster emotional identification with the children. They simply suffer more explicitly, crying, screaming, and wailing. Finally, the Grimm's make really interesting adjustments to the two villains of the tale. Um, while the father is portrayed more sympathetically, um, the mother in the first version has become a stepmother by 1857, referred, mostly, referred to mostly as the woman. This change naturally serves the idealization of motherhood within 19th century bourgeois ideology, where the nuclear family is held up as the foundation of the nation. So a real, a real mother can't be evil. But of particular interest is the subtle way in which the stepmother, um, let's see, just a second, I lost my place. A particular interest is a subtle way in which a stepmother and the witch are now linked. In the 1857 version, both stepmother and witch now berate the children by calling them lazy bones, falenser. This one little hint, this one inserted word ultimately suggests a connection between the witch in the forest realm um, um, with the unexplained death of the stepmother when the children return to their home realm. So they, they kill the witch and they get home and the mother is mysteriously dead with no explanation. It also creates an association between a bad mother who abandons children because she is hungry and a witch who eats children. Um, so this unnatural selfish mother who doesn't conform to the nuclear family paradigm becomes like a witch, godless, animalistic, and monstrous. So we're gonna come back to this associative technique that we see here. Um, okay, so now we turn to the anti-Semitic fairy tale, the Jew and the thorn or the Jew and the thorn bush. Um, which was published in, um, published in the second volume of the first edition in 1815. So earlier Reformation era versions of the story involve mocking a monk rather than a Jew. So we have to view this targeting of a Jewish person in the Grimm story, not as a deep relic of the past, but as a modern innovation at some point. And the tale had a far reaching impact. Um, most famously, perhaps, it comes into play in the portrayal of the villain Beck Messer in Wagner's opera, Die Meistersinger von Nuremberg, um, which in turn is in line with Wagner's rapidly anti-Semitic theoretical piece, Judaism in Music. And there's a 
uh, figure of Beckmesser from an opera. I'm not sure what, I think that's during the Nazi period. Um, Wagner's influence on Hitler is, was of course profound. I also think it comes into play in the horrific ending of the Nazi propaganda film, Jud Seuss. Um, so my point is just that there is absolutely nothing innocent or inconsequential about this fairy tale. Okay. I am now going to read aloud the original version, so the early version of the fairy tale in English translation. Um, so you can follow along with me with the slides or with your handout, and it's going to take me about seven and a half minutes to read. So while I'm reading, I'd like to suggest that, that you might try to imagine that you are a 19th century child hearing this story for the first time. And so what reactions or questions might come to your mind, just simply about the story at face value. Okay, um, here we go. I need a drink of water, just a second. Okay, a farmer had a hardworking and faithful servant who served him for three years without receiving any wages. Finally, it occurred to the servant that he really didn't want to work for nothing. And he went to his master and said, I've served you honestly and tirelessly for a long time. That's why I trust you'll now want to give me what's due to me in keeping with God's commandments. However, the farmer was a sleazy man and knew that the servant was simple-minded. So he took three pennies and gave him a penny for each year. That's how the servant was paid. Meanwhile, he believed that all this was a, the, the servant believed all this was a fortune and thought, why should I put up with drudgery anymore? I can now take care of myself and be free and have a merry time in the world. So he stuck his huge amount of money in a sack and began traveling cheerfully over hill and dale. When he came to a field skipping and singing, a little man appeared and asked him why he was so merry. Oh, why should I be gloomy? I'm healthy and I've got an enormous amount of money and don't need to worry. I've saved all that I earned from working for my master three years and it's all mine. How much is your treasure? Asked the little man. Three whole pennies, answered the servant. I'm a poor man. Give me your three pennies. Now, since the servant had a kind heart and took pity on the little man, he gave him the money. Then the man said, because you have a pure heart, you are to be granted three wishes, one for each penny. Now you may have what your heart desires. The servant was satisfied with this and thought, I prefer things to money. And he said, first, I wish for a fouling gun that hits everything I aim at. Second, I wish for a fiddle that will make everyone dance when I play it. Third, I want people always to do what I request. The little man said, all your wishes are granted. And he immediately gave him the fiddle and the gun and went off uh, on his way. Well, if the servant had been happy before, he thought that he was now 10 times happier. And he had not gone very far when he encountered an old Jew. A tree was standing there and a small lark was sitting on top of the highest branch and sang and sang. It's a miracle of God that such a little bird can sing like that, said the Jew. I'd give anything to have it. Well, if that's all you want, the bird will soon come down to us, said the servant. Then he took aim with his gun and shot the lark between the eyes so that it fell down from the tree. Go and pick it up, he said to the Jew. However, the bird had fallen into some thorn bushes that were under the tree. The Jew crawled into the bushes, and when he was stuck in the middle of the bushes, the servant took out his fiddle and began playing. Then the, Jew began, then the Jew started to dance and couldn't stop. Instead, he jumped even higher with more force. Meanwhile, the thorns ripped his clothes so that they hung in shreds on him, and he was scratched and wounded, causing his entire body to bleed. For God's sake, the Jew screamed, stop playing your fiddle. What crime have I done to deserve this? You've skinned enough people, thought the servant, so you're just getting the justice that you deserve. And he played a new jig. Meanwhile, the Jew began pleading and making promises and said he'd give him money if he stopped. 
At first, however, the servant didn't think the Jew offered him enough and drove him to dance even more until the Jew promised him a hundred solid gold coins that he was carrying in his bag and that he had just obtained by cheating a good Christian. When the servant saw all that money, he said, well, given this condition, yes, I'll stop. So he took the bag and stopped playing the fiddle. Then he calmly and happily went on his way. Meanwhile, the Jew broke out of the thorn bush. He was half naked and miserable and began contemplating how he'd avenge himself. He cursed the fellow and wished evil things would happen to him. Finally, he ran to a judge and complained that without being at fault, he had been robbed of his money by a scoundrel and that he had been beaten mercilessly. And the fellow who had done this was carrying a gun on his back and the fiddle was hanging from his shoulder. So the judge sent out some couriers and officers who were supposed to track down the servant and see where they could find him. Soon the young man was discovered and brought before the court. The Jew accused the servant of robbing his money, but the servant said, you gave me, you gave the money to me so that I'd stop playing my fiddle. The judge made short matter of all this and sentenced the servant to hang on the gallows. Well, soon he stood on the platform of the gallows with the noose around his neck and he said, judge, please grant me one last request. As long as you don't ask me to spare your life, said the judge. It's not about my life. I just like to play my fiddle one last time. <clears throat> the Jew started screaming, for God's sake, don't let him do this. Don't let him do this. But the judge declared, I'm going to allow him to do this one last time and let's leave it at that. Also, since he had such talent, nobody at the marketplace wanted to refuse or have his request denied. For God's sake, the Jew shouted, tie me up. Then the servant took the fiddle and stroked it with the bow. Everyone started to shake and sway, the judge, the clerk, and the officers. Nobody could tie up the Jew. Now the servant stroked the fiddle a second time and the hangman let go of the rope and began to dance himself. And when the servant really started fiddling, everyone danced together, the judge and the Jew at the head of all the people who had come to the marketplace to watch. At the beginning, it was quite merry, but since the fiddling and dancing didn't end, they all screamed miserably and pleaded with the servant to stop. However, he refused to do it unless the judge granted him his life and also promised to let him have the hundred gold coins. In addition, he yelled to the Jew, you swindler, confess and tell us where you got the money from. Otherwise, I'll keep playing fiddle for you only. I stole it. I stole it, he screamed so that everyone heard him, and you earned it honestly. So the servant stopped playing the fiddle, and the scoundrel was hung in his place on the gallows. Okay. So as a way to help us think about why the Grimm's changed what they eventually did, and again, it's on your handout if you want to look, um, I asked I asked everyone to imagine your response to the story as a child, and I also came up with my own list of imagined responses from the fictional child, and here they are. Um, first of all, why was a servant so mean to the old man who just liked the bird song? Why did he wound him and make his body bleed all over? Is the servant the good guy? Is the Jew the bad guy? I'm confused. Uh, why did the servant want so much money from the old man? I thought he didn't care about money. The judge trusted what the Jew said and didn't trust the servant. Judges are wise, so they knew who to, know who to trust, right? And whatever happened to the mean farmer who didn't pay the servant in the beginning? And finally, I don't like this story very much. Can I hear one about magic animals now? Um, okay, so I'm gonna kind of work through these, these questions that again, I've imagined that a child might ask listening to this story. So we'll beginning with the, with the question, why was the servant 
so mean? What justifies torturing this old man? Well, the um, implicit justification for persecution is sinister um, but subtle in the 1815 version. A friend, um, the one you heard, right? A friend, Martha Helfer, who wrote about this fairy tale, pointed out that the thorn serves as an allusion to the crown of thorns used to mock Christ. Um, so in this reading, the logic of payback for Christ's death is based on the endlessly destructive defamatory accusation of deicide, of the idea that, quote, the Jews killed Christ. The bloody body of the old Jewish man, therefore, is supposed to recall and be justified through the kind of mental image of Christ's bloody body. Um, two, the torment of the Jew is also justified through a literalized metaphor uh, that happens to work in both English and German. He is said to have skinned good Christians financially, and there, so therefore he is literally having his skin torn off by the thorns. Both elements, the thorn motif and the skinning metaphor, appeal to core anti-Jewish conceptions that an adult might get. But for children, they're external to the story, um, more than a little bit abstract, and a good deal less vivid than the mental image we have of this tortured, bleeding body of an old man. Um, in short, it is not very effective propaganda, uh, for children at least. Um, okay, so solution in 1857. So the Grimm's adjusted the story to make persecution seem more like play. Um, and again, you can follow along in your handout if you like. So while in the first version, it seemed as if the servant might have planned, it's not really clear, might have planned to trap the Jew in the thorns and to torture him in this way. This time, once uh, he, he, th this time the servant is seized by a spontaneous mischievous spirit or mutvilla after the Jew has already climbed into the thorn bush. It's not premeditated. It's, it's just something that occurs to him to do. Um, in this version, the Jew is no longer described as old, thus making him seem less of a frail and vulnerable victim. And meanwhile, his physical torment is played down. In place of blood and wounding, we have more harmless, um, ha more harmless description, quote, but the thorns ripped the Jew's coat to shreds, combed his goatee, and scratched and pricked his entire body. Finally, the Jews dancing in the thorn is described cartoonishly. All at once, the Jew began to lift his legs high and leap in the air. So the result is a less viscerally disturbing account, at least on the surface. Um, okay, so my next imagined question, who is good, who is bad? I'm confused. Um, okay, just to clear things up, the Grimm's add the adjective good in front of the noun servant four times in the story. Um, the servant also emerges, I won't dwell on this, but emerges as a little bit more sympathetic and kind in his interactions with the, little, with the old man. It turns out the man is poor and unable to work. Um, the servant invokes God in that exchange. Um, okay, and then, um, at the same time, so the servant is made better, the Jew is made, rendered more foreign looking and sounding, more of an outsider. He now sports a goatee, uh, a tegenbart, literally a goat beard. And the evocation of the goat plays into a whole network of imagery connecting Jews and the devil. Um, so you see right here is a detail of an anti-Semitic mural that was publicly displayed in the city of Frankfurt. And you see here that beard, but also the horns the Jews were purported to have because of a mistranslation of a biblical description of Moses. And this figure is labeled there as a Jew devil. Um, okay, so the Jew not only looks different, but he also sounds different. The Grimm's evoke Yiddish or Judendeutsch in his speech. The expression, oh, uh, which was kind of like oy vey, right? Um, 
appears three times. Uh, and you see on this slide, this is from that same mural in Frankfurt. They use that same, or, oh, I don't even know how to pronounce it, uh, or they, um, here as well to kind of to mock Jewish speech. Um, also, in the 1857 version, the Jew waits until the servant leaves and then utters a long catalog of colorful and hyperbolic curses, threats, and laments that also play into stereotypes of Jewish vengeance. For this wailing clamor, the Grimms use the very archaic medieval term Zetergeschrei, which means a hue and cry demanding that a criminal be caught. All of this contributes to a caricature of an uncanny outsider from another time and place. So again, we have a much stronger, clearer delineation between servant and Jew, good guy and bad guy. Okay, my next question. Why did the servant demand so much money from the old man um, if, he, if he didn't care about money? Um, Okay, so you recall that in the 1815 version, the Jew offers money, but the servant keeps playing until he gets a sum all the way up to 100 gold coins. The obvious problem here is that the servant now appears to be as greedy as the Jew is purported to be. So the Grimm's fix in the 1857 version is that the Jew spontaneously offers a whole bag of gold without being asked. Well, um, if you're going to be that generous, said the servant, then I'll gladly stop my music. Okay, next question. Why does the judge trust that the Jew is telling the truth? In the 1815 version, when the servant challenges the Jew's account after being arrested, the judge makes, quote, short matter of the affair, except, accepts the Jews version and sentences the servant immediately to death. Thus the judge, a figure typically associated with discernment, um, would seem to grant the Jew a margin of credibility. And the fairy tales don't really matter. I mean, types are really important. So, you know, if it's, it's a judge making this judgment. Um, okay, so how did the Grimm's fix this? In the 1857 version, the Grimm's add the judge's rationale. The servant says, I didn't touch the Jew and I didn't take his money. He gave it to me of his own free will so that I'd stop fiddling since he couldn't stand my music. Uh, and, but the judge did not believe the servant either and said, that's a poor excuse, no Jew would ever do what you said. That is, the judge only believes the Jew because of his blanket burden, uh, verdict on all Jews, i.e. that they would never give away money through their own free will. Um, thus, uh, we see here that prejudice receives a kind of official stamp of legitimacy. Okay, continuing on. Okay. Uh, I don't like this story. Where are the magic animals? Um, for our fictional child, unschooled in the subtleties of anti-Semitism, as we might like to imagine, it's hard to imagine what the attraction of this charmless tale of torture and execution would be. And I added animals because animals are actually a very important feature of fairy tales. Okay, in 1857, the Grimm's adjusted the final scene to make it a bit more jolly and to include a dancing dog. Um, with the third stroke of the bow, everyone leapt up high and began to dance and the judge and the Jew led the way, jumping highest of all. Soon everyone joined in the dancing. All the people who had come to the marketplace out of curiosity, old and young, fat and skinny, they all mixed together. Even the dogs that came running, that came running, stood on their hind legs and hopped about. And there you see a sort of, you know, quote, charming illustration from the 1890s. Okay, um, but if you're paying close attention, maybe you've noticed I skipped over one question from my fictional child, and it happens to be the one that I think is the most important. What happened to the mean farmer at the beginning of the story? Okay, here we see some really interesting shifts. 
The man described as a farmer in 1815 becomes a rich man by 1857. In 1815, he is characterized as a sleazy man. Uh, the German word is filz. So a nice convenience when you are um, interpreting the Grimm's is that they also compiled their own massive historical dictionary, a bit like the OED. So you could look up words to figure out exactly why they might have used them. Um, and they were exceedingly sophisticated in their word choice. So a filz in its origin is associated with a kind of rural type, right? A, a dishonest ruffian. Uh, so I adjusted my translation um, to a sleazy lout. <laughs> In 1857, that man becomes a miser, Geizhals, a term that falls into the same semantic field as a usurer. I mean, you can find in the Grimm's long entry that uh, the German term for a usurer. So um, a dishonest yokel turns to a rich miser, and you can probably guess where all of this is headed. Um, now, the 1857 version also conspicuously and repeatedly draws words from 19th century economic discourse. And we can recall that in the meantime, Marx had published his Communist Manifest, Manifesto um, in 1848. So we see the word work or labor, Arbeit, three times in the last edition. In the earlier one, you just have the verb uh, to work appear once. Um, the most striking new term, because it is so atypical for a fairy tale is capital. I mean, that's just not fairy tale, fairy tale register. Uh, the good servant who understood very little money um, in, this, in the 1857 version puts his, put his capital into his pocket. We also get the word wage, loan in German twice, um, and the related word remunerate, belohnen once. So in short, the farmer who oppresses and cheats the servant of his rightful wages is now cast in terms identified with capitalism, wage, labor, and capital. And the association of Jews with greedy capitalists, I'm sure I don't need to tell you, was a pillar of 19th century anti-Semitism. And of course, it remains, sadly, a core aspect of anti-Semitism today. Um, but how do the Grimm's establish parallels between the rich man in the prologue who is beginning to take on the contours of anti-Semitic stereotypes and the Jew. Um, okay, both versions end with the Jew admitting he stole money and that the servant earned it honestly. That could conjure parallels to what happens in the beginning where the servant earned money that was essentially withheld or stolen from him. But the 1857 version sharpens the connection. Here, the Jew exclaims after the servant has been sentenced to death, you slouch, you miserable musician, now you'll get what you deserve. Um, but a more precise English translation is now you'll receive your well-earned wage. Uh, the word again here is loan, as we saw in the, in the prologue um, uh, twice. This can remind us of what I observed in Hansel and Gretel through a few well-placed words in parallel the Germans, uh, the Grimm's, the Grimm's suggest that the selfish stepmother is somehow connected to the witch, not on the level of plot per se, but within some greater moral economy that sort of all connected, all connectedness, which I said is, is a feature of fairy tales. Um, okay, coming to my conclusion. Thus, we have seen how the Grimm's craft the 1815 fairy tale into a much more effective vehicle of anti-Semitism by casting the torment as mere mischief, by making the servant good, by rendering the Jew an uncanny cartoonish outsider who looks and sounds different, by letting the judge render his verdict against all Jews, but by far the most insidious development is this enhanced linking of the main action to the prologue. The Grimm's thus structure the narrative to suggest the Jew is somehow rightfully punished for the actions of the rich man in the prologue. Sure, again, it's, you know, uh, literally it says that we stole it from a good Christian man, but that's all offstage action that's, that isn't really highlighted. Um, they thereby suggest that guilt is transferable 
a matter of mere analogy or resemblance. Um, this, in a nutshell, is the logic of scapegoating, where one pays for the crimes of others. Um, meanwhile, the Grimms have shifted the vague guilt for which the Jew is punished. From traditional religious anti-Judaism, where all Jews for all time are held guilty for killing or rejecting Christ, the fairy tale now embraces modern economic anti-Semitism, where all Jews are held guilty for society's economic ills. Um, so I wish I could end on a more positive note. <laughs> But I do think that there is power in taking apart these sort of fundamental fictions like fairy tales that have such an influence on how we think. Thank you very much.